Hey, this is John. Let's Talk Native is now on Patreon. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash let's talk native. We will be producing exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Thanks for checking us out. Let's Talk Native is produced at the Eltian Studios on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Sego, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Erasing history. And I'm not talking about... Uh, Knocking statue, statues down or canceling mascots is erasing history. But I want to get into this. I want to get into how this is being represented, what is being misrepresented. And I want to talk about two terms or two expressions that are completely being misrepresented. And one of them is cancel culture and the other one is political correctness. So we're going to go through some of this stuff. But first, you know, what was in the news is that over the Thanksgiving into National Native American Heritage Day, <laughs> the Friday after, um, some statues came down and some were, were painted over and, uh, and otherwise modified. Uh, and this happened in four cities and includes Minneapolis, Spokane, um, uh, Portland, and Chicago. And it was interesting because it was a range of, of targets. I mean, it was Lincoln and Washington, McKinley, who I personally have an issue with. And we'll even talk about a local <laughs> uh, happening that uh, as it relates to, to a McKinley monument. Um, and, and also the defacing of a, of a uh, monument to westward expansion and the pioneers of, uh, of America. Um, the interesting thing is I was glad to see that land back was among some of the things that was, uh, you know, spray painted or painted on, on some of these, um, these monuments. And, and I gotta tell you, I, I have no problem with, with some of these false representations of history or this, all the, or the false heroism associated with these, these figures, um, I have no problem with them being defaced. And I know people say, oh, you're promoting vandalism. Well, whatever. I, you know, I, when I think about erasure and historical erasure, those statues represent erasure. Not the knocking them down part, not, not the painting them over, but the fact that these historical figures, I mean, when I think about what were carved into what people know as Mount Rushmore today, that is erasure. Not only did you deface a Mount, uh, you know, the, the the Black Hills, the the mountains of the Black Hills, the, the uh, Lakota Dakota Territory. Not only did you deface that, but you defaced it by putting these images on there that represent Ronda de Gaius, what we call the town destroyers. I mean, it's it is really, it's, it's really it is really really frustrating when I when I see how history is uh, is represented and, and look we've talked about it on the show I've met my grandson in um, we've talked about you know some of these these statues that you know that have um, been toppled or defaced since the murder of George Floyd uh, in association with uh, with the false narrative associated with Columbus all of that stuff um, but it was interesting that in what some Native people call the National Day of Mourning, while Americans call it their their Thanksgiving holiday, um, and then <laughs> the Friday that most people recognize as Black Friday, certainly more than they do um, National Native American Heritage Day. It, it's interesting that there was there were that there was demonstration that there was pushback and and that, that it was in many places. 
because of what my what I understand is the the Hawaiian history, I have no problem seeing somebody like like McKinley being the target of uh, of, of some of this some of this cancel culture, <laughs> and uh, because. I have no problem canceling some of these historical figures. As I was asking my grandson, you know, look, they don't teach them that that Washington or Jefferson or any of these presidents were slaveholders. That, that gets completely missed because they don't want that part of the narrative out there. So I say we do have the right to cancel people in our uh in the historical narratives that we're willing to accept when they are a part of, you know, some atrocity. I mean, and whether we're, we're canceling some, uh, a, a contemporary per, uh, participant in a movement because of some of the things that we learn about them or whether we're canceling some of these historical figures. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with the cancel culture when it's associated with, with making a correction of history. See the way it's been appropriated by the right is that, this is some sort of travesty. I mean, literally, Trump is is um, threatening to veto a spending bill associated with military spending <laughs> because attached to that military spending budget was uh, the call to change some of the names of military bases that are named after Confederate generals because he is calling that some travesty associated with what he's calling this cancel culture. I don't think there's anything wrong with canceling some of these uh, these heroes of the South because they were look these these guys were fighting for slavery. I don't. The other expression that I talked about was was political correctness. Look, there's nothing wrong with being politically correct as long as that, that you're being morally, socially, you know, and and any other way correct. I mean, the alternative is to be politically incorrect or to be morally incorrect. And so when I hear people say something, oh, that's just political, political correctness run amok. Well, what's the alternative? Political incorrectness that, that runs unabated? So no, I have no problem with correcting the, the political messaging or imagery associated with, with some of this, this false telling of history, this revisionist history. I, I, we get, I keep hearing this as it relates to, to the mascot issue. Yeah, that that somehow if we remove a race-based mascot, that that's part of uh, you know some travesty associated with cancel culture. Well, it is cancel culture because that stuff should be canceled. We shouldn't allow this stuff. And so I don't ha I have I don't have a problem with canceling some of this stuff. I don't have a problem with cancel culture, and I don't have a problem with pol political correctness. So when when I hear the right try to make those two things sound like they're they're a bad thing. No, I think we have the right to, to re-examine something that was socially acceptable and hold these, this revisionist history or, or, or perhaps some things come to light that we didn't know. And then when we find out, wait a second, that person isn't what, what we thought that person was. Well, get rid of them. We don't need that person in, in our movement. We don't need that person in our historical narrative. We don't need to have our town center have a statue, a monument to that person. So if you want to call that some, if you want to call that cancel culture, I'm fine with calling it cancel culture, but, but I think it's appropriate. We can argue whether, you know, <laughs> whether, whether running a, a car into those monuments is, uh, is appropriate or not. I mean, uh, one of the things that did happen even here in Buffalo, Buffalo is, is a city that has this strange infatuation with uh, with McKinley and with Roosevelt because it was in Buffalo that McKinley was was assassinated and so there, there's uh, they they make a big deal about the inaugural site where, where Roosevelt was inaugurated because of this assassination they have streets named after McKinley I'm surprised they, they actually don't have many more as many named after after Roosevelt but which I'm okay with but they have monuments right in front of the town hall, the, the main center in downtown, they call it Niagara Square. I never call, I understand why they call them squares when they're round. But anyway, uh, so Niagara Square, um, in the center is a monument to McKinley. And on Thursday, Thanksgiving morning, somebody hit that at a high rate of speed, literally got a van airborne 
and struck the monument. Didn't knock it over. But a, but a woman was killed, tragically. Um, still don't understand what that was about. I don't know if that was, you know, done as a protest. It seems like a crazy way to protest. But, um, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what was involved in it. But it was interesting to, to find out that the, the McKinley Monument was was run into because it, it you literally had to get a vehicle airborne to hit it. Um, and then when I find out in Chicago that a, that a McKinley statue was, uh, was defaced. Uh, is it just a coincidence? I, I, I don't know. But um, interesting, when I saw the post in, in Buffalo, and I, I basically said, yeah, it's okay, McKinley sucked. And somebody, and then, you know, somebody, you know, laughed out at me because they don't even know what McKinley represented. But from a Hawaiian standpoint, McKinley is one of the guys who was involved in the illegal annexation or, the, or not, not even annexation, the illegal occupation of Hawaii. And that's why I have an issue with, with McKinley. Anyway, um, but yeah, so these four cities, you know, four separate states um, experienced some pushback on this Thanksgiving uh, National Native uh, his, uh, Heritage, or whatever it is, day. I don't know. Um, and and again, when I start hearing the the language that is used uh, to condemn that, and and I and I saw this, I heard some of that same language, and and and, and it was interesting because this happened because even as I wanted to do this show, I wanted to talk about erasure, and and I'll get into it more in the second half of the show. Um, what what I wanted to talk about, but. The, I started hearing this this expression "cancel culture" and political correctness um, re upped during this this mascot debate issue. Me me going to my my old high school, I mean, and hearing young people throw this expression around, uh, completely not understanding what what is involved with the with the notion of cancel culture or political correctness. And it, well, of course, it's not just young people. Um, I think when there was a, uh, an effort in the state legislature to um, to prohibit state uh, uh, schools from having mascots, uh, one of the the old sage Republicans in in the state legislature, you know, basically said, "Oh, there's more important things to do than you know, schools are suffering enough. People are going through enough. We shouldn't have to do this. And this is just political correctness run amok." And every time I hear that expression, political correctness run amok. It just frustrates me because, you know, what is that? What is what is that, that supposed to mean? For one thing, if something is incorrect, when is it ever wrong to correct it? So if something is politically incorrect, I mean, because essentially when you're saying political correctness run amok, what you're saying you're still acknowledging that that there's something wrong with it, but the, the but the, somehow the idea of correcting it is a bridge too far. I mean, it, it's it's bizarre when when I hear this stuff. So when when I again when we're going through all of this this notion of cancel culture being a negative thing and political correctness being a negative thing, I I'm asking somebody to explain it to me. How is correcting something wrong? How is the idea of canceling, you know, a an image or a, a personality or a narrative? that is either false or damaging, how is canceling that a, a, a travesty? Well, it isn't. I mean, and this is something, look, we all have an obligation here. Yeah. Again, when I think about what our kids are being taught in school, I mean, even at the youngest of ages, what, what they're being taught. But then the, the media runs along with this stuff. And, and I hear the, the way things are described, you know, as terrorism or vandalism, yeah, look, for one thing, if you knock a statue down, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. If you knock a statue down, that's not violence. It, the statue is not a, it, it may be a statue of a person, but it's not a human being. Unless you knock it on top of somebody on purpose, then the idea of toppling a statue is not violence. You can call it vandalism if you want. You can call it that. Um, I call it nonviolent direct protest. And, and I know that some people say, yeah, but that'd be wrong. What if somebody was doing something like that in your neighborhood or whatever else? Look, I'd be fine with seeing some of the things that I think are, are politically incorrect being corrected. So when I hear um, 
even the use of riot being uh, being explained as as this terrible, negative, violent, you know, violent act. Look, one of the guys who was associated with 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 peace movements and civil rights, Martin Luther King, and he said, "Riot is the voice of the unheard." And and I, and I look, it doesn't matter. You can find the the politicians on the left are going to be equally condemning of somebody riding land back on a on a on a monument as as the right would. So this is one of those areas, again, it doesn't matter right or left, they're going to condemn us for, for trying to exercise our voice because our voice isn't heard any other way. You know, and I, I've already, you know, beat to death this idea of the, the pointlessness of, of Native people voting and, and our participation in, in, the, in the conventional political uh, systems that are out there. We don't accomplish anything there. So... What is the way that our voice is heard? Is it heard in the ballot box? No, it isn't. Is it heard when a, when a statue comes tumbling down? Yeah, it, it's heard then. <laughs> is it heard when decolonize is, uh, in, in blood red paint is painted across a George Washington monument or a, you know, or a, or a pioneer monument? Yeah, you're, you got some attention that time. But we wouldn't have gotten any... It's taken forever for... Even the, the protests that are now in its 51st year, this idea of declaring American Thanksgiving as, as a national day of mourning by Native people. I mean, even the protests in Plymouth have been grossly undercovered. So it doesn't matter if we, if we assemble. It doesn't matter if we, you know, if we you know, put a blockade up necessarily until it inconveniences somebody. Then it matters. Then our voice is heard. And you can call it riot, you can call it vandalism, but I'm sorry. L let's not let's not stretch it to things like like violence and terrorism. It is anything but that. Nobody is terrorized by riding land back on a on a statue. Nobody is terrorized or or violently uh, has had, had an act of violence perpetrated against them if a statue is knocked over. And I, look, and I know. Some of you are probably more okay with, with a Columbus statue being toppled than with a, with a George Washington statue, father of the nation. <laughs> and when I asked my grandson, I says, what did they tell you about George, George Washington? He says, oh, the father of the country. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Then, it's, <laughs> then there's an awful lot of bastard children that came from that. <laughs> let, me, let me just put it that way. But, but these guys have represented, I mean, George Washington said it over and over again on the show with, with his military actions and orders against the Senecas and, and other, uh, others of the Haudenosaunee, he basically codified terrorism as a military strategy in his orders to Sullivan. He said, let the Seneca, let them feel the terror of their chastisement, meaning that we're going to chastise them and they need to be terrorized by it. They, in fact, the hope was that there would be such a level of intergenerational trauma that, that the Senecas would never, or, or the Haudenosaunee, would never dare stand up to the United States again. And, and, and frankly, you would hear that in president after president after president. Thomas Jefferson, when Thomas Jefferson was talking about how we need to cultivate their love. We need them to be convinced that we care about them. And if they oppose us, we'll simply just crush them. We'll destroy them. We'll, you know, and that's, and basically, that's, that was Thomas Jefferson. He was considered the enlightened one. You know, the enlightened one of the whole stable of slaves, right? <clears throat> so, this is the, this is the part of history that is never talked about. So, when we try to correct the narrative, and then we get accused of being, you know, overly pol political correct. No, we're just being correct. We're just correcting the historical record. And if somebody says, well, that's cancel culture. No, we're going to cancel your narrative. <clears throat> we're going to cancel the, uh, your revisionist history. And we're going to replace it with, with true history. You can still tell your heroized stories of these guys. But it has to be balanced. It has to be balanced with, with some truth. And, and some of that truth is ugly. American hi, hi, America's history is ugly. And the ugliest cha uh, pieces of each chapter of American history oftentimes have Native people in it.
because we have been the perpetual victims of, uh, of war crimes by the United States and their predecessors. So when I talk about genocide, I'm not talking about genocide having been committed 200 years ago. I'm not even talking about it being, having been committed 100 years ago. I'm talking about genocide that continues. <clears throat> I know it sounds like hyperbole when I say that, that white people appropriating our, our identities for their amusement and entertainment in the form of these native mascots, that high school, schools that are supposed to be safe places for kids, school, uh, places that, that kids are not supposed to be having stereotypes you know, reaffirmed, but th th this idea that, uh, that, that stereotypes are, pro are, are appropriate, that should be what schools work against. But so when, when I talk about those kinds of things and, and, the, and the need to correct those things and then get accused of cancel culture, well, um, yeah, I guess I, guilty as charged because I think we need to correct the record. I think some of this stuff has to be canceled because there does have to be a proper narrative given. There does have to be um, equity in what we're teaching children. <clears throat> because otherwise, how do they come out of that experience with, with a worldview? Look, if you're going to, you know, if you've got walls built around your, your town, you know, whether, whether those walls are you know, real or, or just social walls that, that your kids never leave. Yeah, maybe you, could, you can shelter them from the, the reality of the rest of the world or how the rest of the world views certain things. But there, but there isn't those walls. And your kids are going to leave. And they're going to go out to a world. They're going to find out, oh, wait a minute, that's, that wasn't appropriate. You mean that's what my town did to me? That's what my school did to me? So yeah, we need, we need to correct that stuff. And part of what I do with this, with this podcast, with this show, with, this, with these videos is try to offer a different narrative. And I look, I know, I know that some of what I talk about is uncomfortable for some people to hear because they grew up with this stuff. I mean, there are people my age and older who have never heard the truths associated with the genocide committed against Native people. So when I tie the word genocide to, to the mascot issue, again, I, I say it over and over again, genocide isn't just murder. It isn't just sterilization. It is those things. But it's not just those things. It is creating the conditions that a people cease to exist, that, that would make a people cease to exist. That's what genocide is. And to take it one step farther, it's, it's creating the conditions with the intention knowing that people are going to be uh, marginalized and, and, and no longer have their identity recognized. And so when I think about mascot issues, what happens with, with these images and with much of the way history is taught, everything is done in a snapshot through the lens of a single snapshot of what a person is or a people, what a people are. Look, you can do a snapshot of a person perhaps because their lifespan is only limited. But when you're talking about the history of a people, to say this is what an Indian is, and then you've got, you know, some stereotypical image, you say that's what an Indian is right there. Like, we never existed before that image or after that image. That's erasure. That is erasure. And that's this idea of, of canceling a people, which is wrong. And so what when... I know that this idea of cancel culture is being pitched as this negative thing because people are saying, oh, yeah, cancel culture is just about erasing history. No, it's not. No, it isn't. Cancel culture is about correcting history. It's about taking people out of your world that do not conform to what the world, what your worldview is and, and, or, or what your experience is. So if you've got somebody who... And look, we've seen this even in native movements. There are, there are places where allies have come in. Then it turns out some of those allies aren't, aren't what we thought they were. You know, that they have a history of sexual uh, abuse or assault or, or some other character that, characteristic that we don't want to be associated with. So, we, so we, we get rid of them. I'm not saying we bury them, but we, 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 we throw them out of our, our, of our camp. And we cancel them. 
we no longer are going to acknowledge them. This is the idea that in, in a culture that one of the things that you do to somebody who is um, damaging to your community is you, you cast them outside your circle. That's the cancel. That's, but it's, it, it's not denying the history. It's letting somebody be held accountable for their own personal history or, or a society being held accountable for a history. That's what we're talking about here. So, no, I, I think the, the whole idea of toppling a statue or scribing a few, uh, a few messages in some of these, these places of worship, yeah, I look, I know you're saying, well, that's an exaggeration. Well, what is it? When you erect granite or bronze monum monuments to certain individuals, how is that not some sort of heroizing or, 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 you know, or, or worshiping being done? And it's and it's wrong. I, I think it's fine to tell a history of of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson, but tell the truth. Tell the truth. Right now in Albany, <laughs> the the New York State's capital, right in the Capitol Plaza, there's a statue of of Philip Sheridan on a horseback. Now, why is Philip Sheridan? Why is there a statue of him? In the, at, at the New York State Capitol. I mean, historically, what, what Sheridan is known for, he is actually known historically uh, for the expression, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That's what he's known for. Now, there can be some debate on whether he literally said that in that way or not, but that's what he's associated with. That's the, that's the one quote that Philip Sheridan is associated with. So why is there this grand marble and bronze statue of Philip Sheridan at the, at the state, state capitol in Albany? Why? Because he was born in the area? I mean, there's nothing in the monument, or, and there's nobody's ever explained what great thing he did for New York. You know, why, why, does, why does that space, does he deserve that space? And, and if that monument is taken down... And is, is that a travesty or should, I mean, or is it saying, look, there are, there's a better representation of, of somebody a, a tied to New York or to the culture or to the, to the area than a guy whose only famous quote in his life was the only good Indian is a dead Indian. I just think that this is, this is what gets missed in all this. Look, Hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about. Again, more I want, I want to talk more about uh, erasure in history because much of it is tied with the removal of the people who have that history. So we'll talk about that when we come back. This is John Gain. This is Let's Talk Native. All right, thanks for coming back. Um, as many of you know, I have taken on the, the mascot battle with my old high school in Cambridge, New York. Uh, they call themselves the Cambridge Indians, and they've done so for over 50 years. Not, not 100 years, but some, well, actually, some are saying that it's 100 years. But one of the things that, that comes out of that conversation is, well, what is the connection between Cambridge, New York, and the native people who predate the foundation of that community. Now, just for geographical reference, um, uh, Cambridge is next to the Vermont border, uh, where Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York kind of come together. It's it's close to the Vermont border, but it's it's in that area of the eastern part of uh, of New York State. And it is where I went to high school, and I went well, I went to grade school in high school from third grade all the way until I graduated in 1978. Um, and there is nothing 
that other than the names of some of the rivers and towns that are there, like Walumsac or, you know, in the Al Albany area in general, Sacandaga, Saratoga, um, you know, there, there are some names that, that, that are associated, Huzik, um, that are associated with, with native words. And most of them have been bastardized pretty good. Um, but as far as the native people, as this debate over the mascot issue has kind of uh, uh, begin to build, I guess, there's been some sort of attempt to acknowledge that it was Mohican territory. And, and so they actually corrected about 20 years ago the logo, which was your typical, stereotypical, I should say, Plains Indian headdress, the full headdress. And, and now they use a, an Eastern Woodland <laughs> uh, image, something that looks like from Last of the Mohicans or something like that, <laughs> I guess. Um, but it's an image that if you search online, it's actually that same image is associated with being a Mohawk or a Mohican. So go figure, right? Um, but it's also an image that's been, that's used by a dozen or more, I mean, maybe even two dozen other schools, not just in New York, but all the way down to the, you know, up and down the, the East Coast. In fact, because of the removal period of time, or removal act, and, and the Native people who were moved out West, that same image is used in Wisconsin and in Oklahoma. So it's, it's, again, it's a very, with almost no variation either. I mean, other than the color scheme that they might have used with it. But the reality is these schools like Cambridge, they do nothing to teach about the native presence that, that predates their town. And when somebody does produce something, it's like it's, you know, oh, yeah, we got to praise that. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, and I saw on one of these um, Facebook group pages associated with memories of Cambridge, somebody posted a story that was published, I guess, in a some sort of historical account of a few native people who lived not in Cambridge, but in the area, you know, I would say south and east of there, a little town called Buskirk. Um, and they, they gave this account of, you know, uh, of some Mohican title holders or, or something along those lines. It, it's pretty sketchy. Uh, it's, you know, it's endearing if you don't want to delve into any depth, so to speak, but, um, it, 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 it doesn't give much information on where did the rest of the people go? And then when these people leave the area, why they left. So there's not much of an account, and, and so this is the only thing that was posted on a on a on a Cambridge a website or Facebook page, and it was oh man, it's so great to hear the history. Of course, none of that history has anything to do with making an argument for keeping the Indians as their nickname and their mascot. But if you look into history, you know, and and for me as a Mohawk or Gunyagahaga, I also know that there's a a Mohawk presence in that same area not just because i lived there but but historically and so i get back to what i talked about in the first part of the show about this idea of creating this snapshot of what you're going to say is the history because that area of what is known as new york which is the essentially the confluence between the the, the mohawk river and the hudson river uh, those valleys coming together, and then some of the other tributaries that feed into those, the Hoosick River, the, uh, some of these other rivers that had names uh, associated with the duck, like Owlkill or Battenkill, some of these other, other smaller rivers. Native people relied a lot on these waterways for, for transportation, especially as they were transporting um, goods, you know, for trade and for, for commerce and that kind of stuff. So that was an area in in that area near the Vermont border, and again between the Hudson Valley, the, the Mohawk Valley, and all these others, where there was um, not just a confluence of rivers, but a confluence of people that would come together socially, commercially, and, and and the like. When white people came along, all of a sudden some of that stuff changes, and one of the things that happened, well, let me back up. You know, I, I often talk about the the, uh, the two row wampum. The Turo Wampum is a is an agreement that we had long before any white man ever came around. It was, in fact, the Wampum represents not just two paths of people, you know, uh, the, the, but it represents our path, the path that we are on, and the path 
perhaps of, of other parts of creation, not just other people, but other parts of creation. It's, it's about understanding that, that we have a responsibility not to be disruptive, that we do have a responsibility to, to maintain a level of peaceful coexistence with the paths of creation. We're not supposed to push against the, the, the tides of nature, so to speak. And as it relates to other people, we've offered this, this idea, this, this tour of wampum to other native peoples because we understand we, we have different backgrounds. Our stories are different. Our, our, our legends are different. Our, our languages are different. Our perspective is So we don't need to, to impose our will on other people. So the idea that we, was that we, we communicated in this wampum belt and it's been, it had been used for centuries, millennia, really. This idea that we're going to acknowledge that we have we share this land. We this is our mother. And we and we we live here. We all live here. And we have established paths across our mother. So the whole idea is to have enough mutual respect that as as we travel on our paths across our mother, we don't need to overtake each other. And so that was that was the concept. Now when white people came, we changed that narrative a little bit. Because they didn't have a path here. So we used a metaphor or a description that, that met the need of, of a people that, that only just got here. We said, imagine this as the river of life. And that we are vessels on that water. You have your ship and we have our canoe. So as we offer you this, this, this wampum belt, understand that this is... Your, the path of your vessel, and this is the path of our vessel. You will not steer ours, and we will not steer yours. Nor will we try to straddle the, those two vessels. You know, and, and, and people have used this expression, well, you can't, have, you can't have a foot in each canoe. Well, that kind of comes from this, this, this concept. So when we offered this to the Dutch, the first white people that, that the Gunja Gahag, the, the Mohawks offered to the Dutch, we did it as an offer of peaceful coexistence and that we acknowledge that, that they have very different ways than ours. They have different things. They have different objects in their vessel than we have. And we will not attempt to take them. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have trade. And it doesn't mean that as we go down that river of life or as we travel across our mother, that we won't encounter similar problems and that, that we certainly are free to help each other, but not overtake each other. So. You know, I, I put that out there. So before white people came, we we were people. I mean, the Haudenosaunee, the, the Mohawks, we were we were people of peace. And in fact, diplomacy was one of our was one of our strong suits. And we had relationships. Look, what what people will sometimes mislabel as the as the Iroquoian Empire. Is 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 an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. I mean, it, it isn't. That's not the way it was. Our influences in terms of language and and and, and other you know, aspects of culture may have been significant, but it wasn't like our jobs were were you know were domination, global domination in the world that we knew. That's not what it was. So when it came to us and and other native peoples. I'm not saying that our relationships were without conflict, but usually we worked towards peace. And we had a peaceful coexistence with Mohicans. And then white people came. <laughs> and among the things that, that the, um, the Dutch in particular were enamored with were beaver pelts. And we ended up going through this era that, we, we, that has historically been called the beaver pelt wars or the beaver wars. And control over that fur trade uh, became a point of contention between rival groups of native peoples. And while the Mohicans may have had a presence in this area known as Cambridge Valley or whatever else, or the, the larger area than that, in the wake of this, this conflict over fur trade with the Dutch and, and the French and others um, and the British, Mohawks pushed the, the Mohicans out of that area. So we had a presence there. Um, and in fact, the Mohicans would ultimately move into an area that was closer to uh, what, is known, what was known as Massachusetts. In fact, many of the Mohicans were, were relabeled the Stockbridge Indians because of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. 
So I'm saying all of this stuff because this is my understanding of the history. And, and you can find some of it written down. But the problem is when people are removed from an area, they take that history with them. So Cambridge is essentially devoid of anybody there who can explain the history. And because so many people have been displaced, including us, as, as my people, Mohawks, we no longer have a, a presence in that area. Our territories are, you know, Akwasasne, Ganawage, you know, there are some, there is some growing presence of Mohawks in the, in the, Mo, in the Mohawk Valley. But in this area of Cambridge, there's, there is almost no native representation. And to the extent that a native family may live there or as, as mine did, or others have, you know, have come and gone, we don't come there with this deep, rich history of what, what took place there. I had to learn this stuff afterwards. I didn't, you know, this wasn't handed down for, to me generation after generation. So when we talk about erasing history, part of the way that history is erased is by removing the people who have that history. And because there is no native presence, essentially, uh, original native presence in places like, like Cambridge, there's nobody to tell that history. So they make it up, you know, and, and, or they fabricate it, or they, they reinvent the imagery. Now, look, there are some names, like I said, there are some town names and some river names, and even some names that get associated with mountains and valleys and that kind of stuff, regional names. But then even what they mean becomes somewhat suspect because it gets twisted up or there may be two or three accounts. Look, you can't even get anybody to decide how the city of Buffalo came to be called Buffalo. There's about four different stories associated with it. Are any of them true? I mean, or, or which one is true? Is any of them? Who knows? But the same kind of erasing of history we experience here in, uh, in, in what we know as Seneca territory today. Because all of this area wasn't only Senecas. There were other native peoples, Tudelos, Eries, Neutrals. These are, you know, a lot of these words are, you know, bastardized somewhat too. But there are other native peoples that, that either we had good relationships with or not so good relationships, relationships with. But that history, I mean, you know, what the, what the white man will say is, well, that's because the Senecas just wiped them out. It's the same thing they'll say on camera. Well, that's because the, the Mohawks just wiped out the, uh, the Mohicans. I don't know that the, that's entirely true. And you know, to, to capture it that way or to always define native people prior to European contact as the, as the, the, the last you know, conflict they can associate with us, that's not accurate either because for the most part, we lived, we lived in, in peace. But see, the nature of, uh, of history is to always bookend periods by, with, with, with conflict. All right, this, is, this was this conflict, then there was this period of peace, then there was the next conflict. So every, every period is defined by some, you know, some moment of conflict. And that's probably not that accurate. I mean, I'm not saying that this conflict doesn't exist. It certainly does. But I think, to, but to define a people or define a period by that conflict, especially when the source of that conflict is oftentimes propagandized. Look, there's there's a lot of mistruths associated with with everything from the Revolutionary War. I mean, and, and the real cause of it, um, the Civil War, the real cause of it. Look, that's still the the, the topic of the day. That's why you you've got people in the North. Still, that'll wave a Confederate flag. What the hell? Are, why would somebody in Silver Creek have a Confederate flag? And look, right up here, one of the, the, the gravel kings in this area, they got their big Trump flags flying with, with Confederate flags flying. What the hell is that all about? I mean, it, it's because of the ignorance associated with history. And, and, and so that's what we see with all this stuff. We see... A failure to tell the truth, to teach it to our to our children, and so the, the the children grow up to be adults, harboring this ignorance, or if not the ignorance, and I don't mean to always make it sound like willful ignorance, but the, just the absence of information. I've said it before on this program, and I, I, I say it often. I meet up with people all the time who don't know a damn thing about residential schools. They don't know anything about 
Lincoln signing the largest mass execution in the history of the United States. They don't know that, that Teddy Roosevelt was a, uh, was a white supremacist. Uh, by the way, I, I mentioned Philip Sheridan saying the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt creates a corollary for that. He said, well, he doesn't necessarily suggest the only good Indian is a dead Indian. But what he said is, in his view, nine out of ten are. And he wouldn't want to look too closely at the tenth. That's, that's a, we're paraphrasing a, a Teddy Roosevelt quote. So these are the kinds of quotes that are associated with these historical figures that, you know, that the history book regions are going to prop up. And, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is a, is a hero because he, you know, he was a New Yorker and he became president in, in Buffalo because they, they, they killed the president that, uh, that he was the vice president too. I mean, this is, but, but there's truth that can be, be taught about all this stuff. There's truth that can be told about how Hawaii became a U.S. territory. There's truth that can be told about how Native people are displaced. And, and then when, and when we tell and we teach about Native people, if you only take a snapshot of time, in time, you're going to ignore all of the history that came before that snapshot that you're promoting and all the history that came after that. And this is where we have a problem. So, so a little village like Cambridge that wants to call themselves Indians, they don't even have a choice in the matter about, um, about whether they can teach any true history about Native people because they don't have it. And there's no desire to have it. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't some historical records, you know, again, all of it usually written by white people because once you remove the people who lived the history, now you're relying on somebody else's account of it. And if it's a written account for, you know, you know, people say, well, the problem with Native people is they never wrote anything down. It was all oral history. I'm going to tell you this right now. Oral history is oftentimes more accurate than the written account because the written account relies on the truth of the person who wrote it, the interpretation of what they were writing, and how we interpret what they wrote whether it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, or 400 years ago. And all of this stuff is problematic because words change, expressions change, perspectives change, and, and political climate certainly change. And so even as we're trying to describe a, a, a place, you know, we'll, we'll use a description of, of the confluence of rivers or whatever else, but even that can change over hundreds of years, what that confluence looks like. There's an area not, you know, not far from Cambridge uh, on the way out there, any, anyways, you're traveling through it, called uh, Kenajahari. Well, uh, and it And what it talks about is how the rivers swirl and form a bowl. Uh, in you know, and at least that's one of the one of the definitions that I've heard of it, right? Uh, and it's about how the water churns. But that's only one of the uh, of the definitions that I've heard, and uh, and it's the one that I trust. But as you look at some of these, you know, all of these other places that have names that are clearly you know come from native languages, whether it's Mohawk or Algonquin or, or whatever, the if you don't have any native people, if you're going to only going to rely on what some white guy wrote down about what it means, that can be pretty meaningless. And it certainly can be you know, problematic. Look, there are still Mohicans, not only you know, farther into Connecticut and, and, and Massachusetts. Um, the, you know, some of the, the, um, the Ramapo, they are Lenape, Delaware. They're closely related. The, the Stockbridge Indians that I mentioned earlier, they would be forced, even though they sided with the colonists, they would lose their land. They would seek refuge and, uh, and move in. Uh, the Oneidas gave them uh, land to live on. Then the Oneidas said, and they, they described the Stockbridge. They actually called them brother town. They called them their brothers. So the, the Stockbridge or the Brotherton uh, Indians, he said they, they have long arms, meaning they, they keep trying to grab more, keep trying to take more. Eventually, those, those Stockbridge would, would go farther out west during the removal periods. Um, and they would actually merge with the Muncie. And so now the only federally recognized, um, Mohicans of that, of that era of, of that region, um, are now called the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican nation. And they pretty much reside in Wisconsin. Now, 
they have tried to assert some presence back in um, in central New York, in the area closer to Oneida, but but not back in the in the in the areas of uh, Vermont, Mo, uh, Massachusetts, and New York. So, and and then when when native voices do weigh in on something like <laughs> like the mascot issue, this was kind of comical because there was a there was a debate about the logo that Cambridge uses, and uh, and for whatever reason, it's a native. Again, a stereotypical Woodlands Indian profile, but it's the face is white. And I said, well, that makes sense <laughs> since it's all white people playing Indian anyway. But they, they want to produce a bunch of shirts because of my push to change the mascots. They want to save our mascot shirts. And it's an orange shirt with a white-faced Indian. <laughs> a white-faced Mohican slash Mohawk, whatever you want to call it. And, and they said, well, we can't, uh, we can't alter the, um, the logo. And what do you mean you can't alter the logo? And they said, well, it was designed by the tribe. And he said, which tribe? Because the, the Mohicans that have weighed in on, on the mascot issue have condemned high school ma native uh, mascots for high schools. So who are you saying developed this thing? I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's absurd. And in and, and a, and a simple look online, you can find dozens of schools that have the virtually the identical logo. So... Did some native guy who claimed to be Mohican design them all? Well, I hope he got paid <laughs> because there's an awful lot of schools using them. And they vary widely. I mean, everything from the, the school colors to whether they colorize the, the, uh, the face or whether it's black face or white face or red face, whatever. I mean, it's, uh, these are some of the absurdities that they've associated with, with how these debates over school mascots take a turn. But what they can't ever get back to is the failure of any historical account of the native people whose land these predominantly white communities now occupy. And, and, and they have no ability to, to look at anything more, if, if they even have this, than a snapshot in time. So is Cambridge Mohican territory or is it Mohawk territory? Well, I, I'm not making the claim as a, as a Mohawk, as a Gunya Gahaga to say, well, that was, that was my ancestor homeland. I know my ancestors made homes there. So in a way, I'm not saying it was exclusively Mohawk territory. But I think as you, as you looked at, at native peoples and whether it's our populations as they swelled, as we followed game, as we followed, you know, various ways to sustain ourselves and as it got impacted by by colonization because native people were used in some of the worst ways uh during the conflicts french and indian war um and that was the, the british and the french uh, and the french fighting native people got used in that the you know a, a lot of the, the the revolutionary war but a lot of the conflicts that existed you know between the, the european powers trying to assert their presence on our lands we get pulled into all those conflicts, Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II. I mean, our people get sucked into these conflicts. And not just the conflicts that, that you can associate with, with a specific war. Like I said, be, the Beaver Pelt Wars. Most people don't even know anything about that stuff. So th these, are the, these are the parts of history. And again, we are not a snapshot. We, we didn't just exist and then cease to exist. We're still here. We're, we're always here. And we will always be here. So when you're going to say, talk about native history, how do, you, how do you choose which spot on a timeline you're going to talk about when you're talking about native people? I once went back to my old high school, talked to a history class. And I drew a line across the room. They had blackboards all around the room. I drew a line all around the room and I put an arrow on either end. I said, this, this is the timeline. At the very, very end of it, I marked out a spot about an inch and I said, this is American history. The rest of it is ours. The rest of that line all the way around the room was our history that you know nothing about. Why? Because you've erased it. You've erased it by erasing us. You know, when people talk about depopulation, the reason they use a word like that is because they don't call it murder because when you say you depopulated something, you can make it sound like it wasn't really people. That it was just 
getting rid of something in the way, like a defoliant. So this is where history is erased. It's not erased by toppling a statue or writing some expression across some monument. That's not erasing history. That's us canceling. That's, that's real cancel culture is because we're canceling what you have put out as a false narrative. So for me, I'm all for cancel culture. I'm all for political correctness because the alternative is to allow a lie to continue. Thanks for listening. I'm John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh. Yeah,